So there's an invitation to come to the banquet. Come. Come today. All right, so we are continuing in the letter of Colossians right now. And so uh, this is sermon number four. But this is also part one, as uh, it will become clearer as to why. So I want to read from verse 13 to 20. Hopefully this will operate, uh, cooperate rather. Well, if someone can press the right arrow on the keyboard, it should, should work. <clears throat> all right, well, it's all good. Okay. Um, you can just press the B button on the keyboard. There I go. Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so Colossians 1, uh, verse 13 to 20. And this is speaking about Christ. It says, Who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption and forg the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? For in Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, and he is above or before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this passage, for it elevates Christ to his rightful place. And Lord, we pray that you be pleased to bless as we look into your word. May your spirit be our guide and our teacher, that we may be taught and be built up in the faith as well. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we come this morning to uh, one of the most Christocentric passages in the Word of God. Christocentric means Christ-centered. It is a passage that elevates Christ, Christ and speaks of Him uh, in specific ways. And uh, so this section focus, focuses on the supremacy and the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ, placing Him at the center of what? Everything. He's the center of everything, as one who is God, God Almighty, who's also at the center of world governments. Now, when I was reviewing my notes, I'm sure some of us might think, what, he's at the center of world governments? But the governments are corrupt. Uh, the governments are antichrist. Well, that's true. But the Lord does appoint governments. We find time and time again, even in the Old Testament, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar, God calls uh, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, and Cyrus, he calls him my Messiah, my anointed one. And these were not believers. Well, Nebuchadnezzar did come to faith. So we think also in the days of Jesus, God was at the center of the government in Rome, where God appointed Pilate to be where he was at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. This was all part of God's plan. We think also of, of Judaism at that time, which was a corrupt uh, government and corrupt religious system, and they were also appointed by God. So we see here Christ, who is God, who is at the center of world governments. Christ is the center of the gospel itself, of course, that goes without saying. Christ is at the center of the cross. Christ is at the center of creation itself, which is what we're going to focus on in the weeks to come. And Christ is also the center of the church. So who is the Lord Jesus Christ to the world? Who is? Who is the Lord Jesus Christ to the world? Well, before I came to faith, I was an atheist, and I had my own views and ideas about who Jesus was, and I thought, he's nothing. Probably doesn't even exist. These were, these were my, my views, my thoughts. <laughs> well, God had other plans. Now I'm preaching the very Christ whom I claim did not exist. In fact, as I was uh, preparing this, I was searching for a picture for the PowerPoint here this morning, and I came upon this weird site where it's a cult group, and this guy claims to be, uh, his name is Buddha Maitreya the Christ, a kind of a lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I thought there's all kinds of wacky stuff out there. And so, and he, uh, he makes this claim that he says, by his works you shall know him about himself. So we see that there are many people in the world, they have all kinds of different ideas. They had a, the world has a million and one ideas about who Jesus is. But there's only one true Jesus, and this is what we're looking at here this morning and also in the weeks to come. So, who is Christ to the world? Well, Jesus is anything and everything. But who is Christ to you, the believer? Who is Christ to you, the believer? In truth, even professing Christians and even true believers have different ideas about the person of Christ. What I'm saying here is that even the early believers, the early, early disciples, they were trying to understand who Jesus was. If you read the Gospels, you'll see that they, they, they were followers of him, they believed who he was, but they were still trying to understand who he was. <clears throat> and so even believers, we need to affirm our understanding about who the person of Christ is, to strengthen our belief on who Jesus is. And uh, therefore, as we proceed in our text, <clears throat> I'm thankful to Paul for setting aside some time and some space to instruct us about the person, the real person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so may the Lord help us to get to know him more and more. And I need to understand him, who he is more and more. So as we proceed here this morning <clears throat> into Colossians there's one term that helps us to define our Lord, his preeminence. It's a big word and I'll explain that word in a few minutes, but his preeminence. Um, so it comes from the Latin actually, it means to be outstanding. Christ is outstanding. Um, and uh, it means to stand out. It means having paramount rank, dignity or importance. It means supreme. So we, the title this morning is The Supremacy of, and Preeminence of Christ. So basically these are synonyms. So preeminence means all those things and more. And we've already seen in the past few weeks that our Lord is what? Preeminent in the gospel. From verses 1 to 12 or 3 to 12, we saw, we saw the joy of the gospel. There's joy in the gospel. There we also saw the origins of the gospel. The gospel originates from heaven itself. It's not something that is man-made. It is from God himself originates even before the foundation of the world. We also saw the consequence of the gospel. That is the fruit, the fruit of the gospel. That is people coming to faith in Christ. Uh, in one day, how many people around the world are coming to faith in Christ? Thousands upon thousands. So Christ is building a church. He's, he promises that he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We also saw Christ is preeminent in the gospel in the sense of the, where um, there's the priority of the gospel. The gospel must be preached. And uh, Paul says, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And so that's how we come to faith in Christ. People need to hear that there's a Savior, there's, a, there's one who will deliver you from your bondage and slavery to sin, and that is the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how he will achieve that is through the cross. And how he has achieved that is through the cross. And that is the message that people need to hear. That's the message I needed to hear before I came to faith in Christ back many years ago. So secondly, we also looked at the preeminence of the cross, uh, looking at verse 13 and 14. I made a few comments last week. I will expand on this a bit more here this morning. So look at verse 13 and 14. It says here, who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So in essence, what Christ accomplished, what we see here in the text, what Christ accomplished at the cross was what? Our rescue, our deliverance from the authority or the realm of darkness and transferred us over to the kingdom of light. And so we were in bondage to our sins and we were walking in darkness. I'm reminded what it says in Ephesians 5 verse 8. Paul says, for at one time you were darkness. Not only were we in darkness, we were darkness. There was darkness within us, yet we did not see it. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And that's a major transformation, isn't it? We were rescued. And so with Christ's work at the cross, it was a victorious rescue operation. 
it was a victorious rescue operation. I like that. And I was thinking about this. Yeah, I like that. It's a rescue operation. So now all Christians will agree that the cross was a total victory. It will, will you see a Christian says, well, it was a partial victory. No, it was a total victory. It was a complete victory. All Christians will agree with that. But why do some Christians teach that the cross only makes it possible for sinners to be saved? As, oh, I, you know, did Christ come on earth? So, well, I, I hope even one comes to faith. No, he came guaranteeing, guaranteeing and securing the salvation of his people, Matthew 1.21 says. So it is, it is astonishing to me that uh, many Christians, uh, well, I, I can understand because I, I struggle with that as well as a younger Christian. So the cross does not make it possible for sinners to be saved. It guarantees the salvation of those whom he has called from the foundation of the world. In James 1 verse 18, it says here, of his own will he brought us forth. Uh, so we think of, uh, you know, do we have uh, freedom of the will? Uh, yeah, we do. But we don't have absolute freedom. I don't have absolute freedom of the will. I can't levitate myself uh, off the ground, you know, at, at will. I can't go to the planet Pluto at will, hold my breath there for the whole time while I'm there, uh, and then come back. I, you know, I, if I'm sick with a flu or something, I can't at will just snap my finger. Oh, I, I, I will heal myself. No, we see that in the spiritual realm, we are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. We are dead in trespasses and sins, and so we are not capable of saving ourselves, which is why this was secured from the foundation of the world, from before the foundation of the world. Our salvation was secured by Christ. It was in the plan, plan and mind of God to secure and save a people for himself. So when Christ came, he rescued us. It was a victorious rescue operation, and we saw in this morning in John chapter 10, not one will be lost, uh, that Christ has come for his sheep. And we will actually see, look at this in a, in a few minutes here. So does salvation rest with us or with Christ and his work? And, and sadly, in some circles, they say, well, it depends on you. It's your decision. It's your power of decision. Well, I don't have power to decide something like that because I, I can't. I'm spiritually dead. Like Lazarus, could he raise himself from the dead? No, he could not because he was physically dead. It took the word of Christ alone where Christ says, Lazarus, come forth, and he spoke those words and he came back to life. And so that's the power of God. So the question is, was it a successful rescue operation or not? Well, it was a complete rescue, completely victorious rescue operation. I uh, like the words of uh, Jesus in John 6, 39. It is the will of, the of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. Not one will be lost. Um, in John 18, verse 9, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have, not, I have lost not one. Thus we believe that when Christ went to the cross, he secured eternally our salvation and that all his sheep will hear his voice and be rescued. We were looking at this in Sunday school in John 10. Uh, how, are they, how are they rescued? By believing. By believing on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, John 10, 15 uh, and following it says, Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep which are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will be one flock, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Uh, skipping to verse 26 and 27, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So <clears throat> we see here in verse 13 and 14, this was a successful rescue operation. It says here, who rescued, past, past tense, rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us over to the kingdom of of the son of his love. So it was a rescue operation and we were transferred over to the kingdom of the son of his love. And furthermore, uh, we see here uh, in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sins. So that's the power of the cross. We have full redemption. We have full forgiveness of our sins. And this is the power of the cross. It says here, who rescued us from the, th the authority of darkness. So the cross has this powerful effect, this powerful ripple effect, where it saves to the uttermost all the believers of the Old Testament and saves all the believers of the New Testament. And that's the cross. That's the cross. So let's proceed here this morning. Number three, which is what we're going to look at in verse 15, <clears throat> and we're going to look at only half of this verse, <laughs> and uh, so this sermon is a bit shortened than usual, because the next part is a lengthy topic, and I thought I need a, another whole sermon at least to talk about that. So looking here this morning as, uh, from verse 15 and following, we're looking here at the preeminence of Christ in creation, how he is creator himself. Look at what it says, verse 15 who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So this first part here, who is the image of the invisible God? Now, the identity and of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is central to our faith and salvation. Who he is is central. If just one detail is missing or mis misconstrued, then our redemption is null and void. If there's one thing that is missing, and one thing that is not there, then we do not have salvation. And uh, looking at verse 15 again, it says here, who is the image? What does that mean? Image of the invisible God. Well, the word image here is a Greek word, which is uh, pronounced as ikon, where we get the word icon. Let's think of icons uh, on, your, on your cell phone. There's a little icon there. Well, it's, it's the same idea, a similar idea. So here, the word is ikon, and I'm going to give um, some uh, many definitions here this morning, and I... Uh, I know it could be could sound monotonous, but uh, just just bear with me, please, this morning, okay? So uh, the basic strong concordance dictionary means this word means uh, a likeness. So if it, image means a likeness <coughs> that is literally um, a profile or representation or resemblance. Robertson's dictionary says Jesus is the very stamp of God the Father as he was before the incarnation and is now. Vincent's dictionary says, the logos, the word, which is Christ, underlying the passage, image is more than likeness, which may be superficial and incidental, and it implies a prototype and embodies the essential verity or truth of its prototype. Uh, a, another dictionary that I have, and I'll just skip to the... Uh, uh, to, to 2 Corinthians 4 4, where we see that same term used. Uh, it says here, um, so 2 Corinthians 4 4, I'll read the verse and I'll go into the explanation. In the case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of glory of Christ, who is what? The image of God, the acone of God. And so <clears throat> here, Christ is said to be the image of or likeness of God. There is no difference here between the image and the essence of the invisible God. So when we think of image, in our understanding we think, oh, it's just a, a photocopy. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, it, it's, it's the, he's the real deal. Um, so whenever I have questions, I go to a website called God Questions. So I, I put in my, my thoughts, uh, my, my question, and then so this is what the author says. So the image concept appears multiple times throughout Scripture. I mean, we know it does. When God created humanity, he made them in his image, right? Um, in Genesis 1.27. The Hebrew word translated image can also be translated as statue. And, and that's, not, not, that's not get all upset about that. Uh, we're not advocating the you know, worshiping of Jesus as a statue. Uh, it can also mean inscribed column or idol. In the ancient culture, such as that of Greece, individual deities would have a temple or a statue representing that God, the God of Zeus, for example. God created humanity as representative of him, placing humanity as particularly unique among the rest of creation. Another example of an image is in the ancient, or is in the gospel accounts of Matthew 22, where the religious leaders of the day are attempting to trap Jesus in his words. The religious leaders asked Jesus if the people of God should pay tribute 
to Caesar by paying the annual poll tax. The poll tax was a Roman imperial tax that went directly to Caesar, the leader of the Roman Empire. If Jesus answered in the affirmative, it may have seemed he was disloyal to God. If Jesus stated that they should not pay the tax, then he would be in direct opposition of the governing nation. Uh, Jesus wisely responded by asking for a Roman coin, the currency of the day, as the religious leaders uh, give him one. He asks, Who image is, whose image is this and whose inscription? The image on the coin was the impression of Caesar. So the coin would have on the back of it Caesar, the head of, G uh, of Caesar, and the zealots, especially the, those who were extremists in Israel at that time, they would say, no, 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 that's idolatry. Well, they were incorrect, of course, in their assessment uh, regarding that. Um, and, um, and so uh, here, the image on the coin was an impression of Caesar, a representation of Caesar himself. Jesus then concludes that the people of Israel should give to Caesar what is his. Give it to him. This is interesting because this is tax time. Pay your taxes <laughs> to the government. Uh, and um, so is humanity stamped. So is humanity stamped with the image of its owner. <coughs> Upon us, we have the image of God. We alone have the image of God. Not the chimpanzee, not the orangutan, but we alone have the image of God upon us. And for in Colossians, our text here this morning, the author says, Paul states that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, showing how Jesus is representative of God himself. Uh, in contrast to the rest of humanity, Jesus does not have a tarnished image of God. We have a tarnished image because we are sinners. We have the image of God, but it is tainted with sin. Rather, for Christ, he is an exact representation of his being. Hebrews 1.3 those, uh, those who Jesus have seen, sorry, sorry, those who have seen Jesus have seen the Father. That's in John 14. And we'll turn to that a bit later on. So Jesus is not only the perfect image or representation of God, but what? He is God. Jesus is God Almighty. He is the perfect image of God as well. Jesus is both his perfect image bearer, which is representative, and God himself, actual. The Son, being the image of the invisible God, makes visible the one who is what? By nature, invisible. We'll talk more about that very shortly. So the Son's power, wisdom, and goodness fully and accurately reveal to us the character and perfection of God. Are you still with me? Okay. <laughs> okay, I know it can be technical, but this is kind of important because we need to understand these things so that we can have a, a, a deeper understanding about who Christ is. So let's go to Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. <clears throat> So the author says, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And that we know. The Old Testament is God speaking through the prophets of old. God breathed upon them, and they spoke. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke, and they wrote the scriptures. That's why we have in our hands the, the authentic uh, living word of God. Verse 2, but in these last days, he, God, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And so we will get into this as well in the near future, as we continue in Colossians, where we see Christ is clearly our creator, the creator. Um, so verse 3, he says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint or image. And that word here in the Greek is character. Which, were, which is translated character, the image or the imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification of sins, uh, for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what does all this mean then? Well, Christ then is the, described as the image of the unseen God. What is this but to say that the very nature and being of God have been perfectly revealed in him, in Christ. That is, in him, the invisible has become visible. The invisible has become visible, which brings us to John 14. And I thought about this, and the, the sources that I was uh, 
uh, reading, they, they also turned there, and I thought, oh, we're on the same page. Because John 14, verse 6 and following, uh, verse 6, of course, is the uh, banner on the wall here. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. And then verse 7, look at, look at what it says. If you had known me, um, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So what's going on here? Look at verse 8. Phyllis said to him, said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that is enough for us. <laughs> this is very interesting because Philip, uh, obviously he was trying to understand who Jesus was. And uh, this is one of the many passages that, that, that show this, that the, even the early disciples, they were trying to determine and understand who Jesus was exactly. Of course, they, they would all confess at one point that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Many of them, Nathaniel said that, even Martha in John chapter 11, I believe. And so here is Philip saying, Lord, show us the Father. I think there was some frustration in his tone. Uh, just show us the Father. And it is enough for us. And then Jesus rebukes him, verse 9, uh, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Uh, you know, many, uh, maybe some of us would be in that situation as well, where if we were there, we'd probably try to, try to figure out who Jesus was. <clears throat> Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Christ says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. You'll know who God is through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus. God says, look to the, the ends of the earth. Uh, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We are to look to Jesus, and you will know who God is. You will know who the Father is. So that's why Jesus says, how can you say, show us the Father? How can you say that? Show us the Father. Look at me. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Christ is speaking of the oneness and the unity of the Father and the Son. And so which is why we look at the Father and we see who, uh, sorry, we look at Jesus and we see who the Father is. And so Jesus says, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me uh, does his works. Verse, verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And so, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So this caused me to think about uh, a pastor uh, uh, in a sermon that I was listening to many years ago. He says he was very dismayed when he was visiting... Uh, some people uh, that were part of his church, this would, I think would have been a larger church, in the house that were filled of images of Jesus everywhere, pictures of Jesus. And he was dismayed by that because, and I'll explain a few things about this. Do we need images of Jesus to stimulate our faith, no. to strengthen our faith? Absolutely not. And he, so he was dismayed because when people are fixated on images of Jesus, or what they think Jesus looks like, they basically it means that they have, I forget how, exactly how he said it, but that it means that they, they really don't have a true image of, of, of Christ in their hearts. And my faith is built on what the Word of God has to say. Mm -hmm. I don't care about relics, about images or statues. In fact, God condemns those things. <laughs> we are not to have those. That's the second commandment in Exodus 20. But we are to... Look at what the Word of God has to say and be fixated on what the Word has to say. And that's how we formulate the image of Christ, through His Word. God creates and produces faith in us through His Word. And that is all I need. I don't want images. I don't want statues. I don't want anything else. I want the Word of God. This is what helps me to build up my faith. And that is how we see the Father. We see the Father through the Word of God, where the Word of God elevates Christ to His rightful place. And in seeing Christ, we see the Father and we see God Himself, God Almighty. So looking at verse 15 again, it says, Who is the image? And that's, in a nutshell, and we can expand on this a great deal more, but I think uh, hopefully we have an idea about what this is all about. <clears throat> Christ is the representation of, of God himself, of the Father himself. 
who is the image of what it says, what does it say here? Of the invisible God. God is invisible. I remember witnessing to a young lady, I guess she was would have been my age from the back when I was in my twenties, and I was talking to her about Christ and the gospel, and, and she basically chuckled and kind of laughed at me. <laughs> Why? Have you seen God? <laughs> and I, I forget exactly how I responded, but you know what? Do I need to see God? Yeah. I, I don't need to see God. Uh, in fact, uh, for someone to, to vis visibly in person to see God, you would not live as what we see in, in the scriptures. <clears throat> but because the Word of God says, God is spirit. Uh, what I read this morning in John 4, verse 24, Christ said to the uh, woman of the well, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, uh, <clears throat> so worship is not at a physical location, uh, which is the woman of the well, the Samaritan woman who thought, well, we worship on Mount Gerizim. Uh, Jesus just says that the day is coming when you don't need to worship there or even in Jerusalem. Because, in fact, the worship of God is anywhere you are. As Christians, we're to worship the Lord wherever we are and anywhere we are. And so, regarding this matter of God being invisible, no one can claim to have seen God directly. No one can make that claim. Uh, look at the account of Moses uh, in Exodus 33, verse 20. <clears throat> God said to Moses, but he said, but God said, you cannot see my face for no man, for man shall not see me and live. No one can actually see God face to face and, and live um, and survive the ordeal. But Moses only saw his backside, as where God says, in Exodus 33, 23, and God said, then I will take my, away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Thus, it reminds me of what we see in John 1.18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is, in, is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So no one has ever seen the one true God, and no one will ever see the one true God face to face, of course, only when we get to heaven. Uh, but here, He says, we will see God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says here, no one has ever seen God uh, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So, if you want to know who God is, know Jesus. Come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll know who the one true God is. In fact, I want to read, uh, uh, we see in John chapter 1. John 1, <clears throat> that whole account, verse 1 to verse 5, and so forth. Put my glasses on. <clears throat> so, John 1, 1, 2, Five, because this highlights all of this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. Verse 8 to 10, it says here, He was not the light, but He came to bear witness about the light. There was the true, there was the true light, coming into the world, enlightens everyone. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And then verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So all of this ties in what, what, which, what uh, we have seen already at this point. So Christ is the image of the invisible God. You want to know who God is? Look at Jesus. That's why Jesus is... He's the center of the universe uh, in, in everything. And so we are to point uh, everyone to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not to point people who are seeking for uh, salvation. No, don't point them to a church, but point them to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that will save you. Um, and this takes us back to Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God. Now, looking at this text here, uh, looking at verse 15, it says, the firstborn of all creation. We will look at this next week or in two weeks from now because uh, uh, Zach Singer is preaching next week and Tim will be preaching the following week, so, but the, so it will be in three weeks from now. So we will look at this, uh, the firstborn of all creation. So it's too long for us to get into today, but I just want to conclude here this morning. As stated in the past few weeks, the Colossian church was the recipient of the early 
form, uh, forms of the heresy known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism believed that everything that is physical, everything that is of the flesh, even the human body, is evil, therefore could not be of God. That's why the, uh, the full form of that is in the second century, where um, we see also the beginnings of that, of this, this teaching in 1 John, the gospel, or sorry, the letter of 1 John. But here we see also the early beginnings of this, this heresy that was affecting the early church, where people were questioning the person of Christ, whether he was truly human. But here, Paul is affirming that Christ indeed was truly human and truly God, which is what we're going to emphasize right now. And so, they were the recipients of this early heresy known as Gnosticism, who believed all these things, and um, which is why Paul is teaching these things about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, why he's taking the time to affirm the true identity of the person of Christ. That is, Christ was truly God and truly human in every way. And when the eternal Christ chose to add a human nature, his divine nature, Christ thus became a being having two natures, a truly human nature and a truly divine nature. And that is a stumbling block to the intellects of people of our age, of any age. They say, well, that is absurd. How can that make? It makes sense, but it does. That's what we see revealed in Scripture. Thus, when Paul states that Jesus is the image or the representation of the invisible God, he affirms that Jesus is both God and man. And thus, for us, for humanity, do you want to see who the true God is? Do you want to know who the true God is? Turn to Jesus. Look at Jesus, and you will see who God is. Look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, and turn to him alone. Don't look at yourself. Turn to him, and you will find who God is. And you will find in him one in whom you can surrender the whole of your life. And you will find in Christ one who is a brother and a friend, for eternity, and he will be and will become your eternal Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these truths, and Lord, we know that what we can do and all we can do is accept these things by faith. By faith, we believe that Christ is indeed the image of the invisible God, that he is the exact representation of his being. We thank you, Lord, for this time, and we have much to learn. Help us, Lord, to affirm these things in our minds and our hearts and help us, Lord, to be strong in our faith so that we can share this great truth, uh, this wonderful truth that, uh, that you indeed have, have sent a Savior and this Savior is truly God and also truly man. So now, Lord, we thank you for our time together and uh, I ask that you would help us all together to grow in the knowledge of, um, of his will, of your will, and to grow in grace together. We pray in Christ's mighty name. Thank <laughs> you.